The Ninety Five Theses by Martin Luther. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. The Ninety Five Theses by Martin Luther. Translated by R. S. Grignon. Introductory Note by R. S. Grignon. Martin Luther, the leader of the Protestant Reformation, was born at Eisleben, Prussian Saxony, November 10, 1483. He studied jurisprudence at the University of Erfurt, where he later lectured on physics and ethics. In 1505 he entered the Augustinian monastery at Erfurt, two years later was ordained priest, and in 1508 became professor of philosophy at the University of Wittenberg. The starting point of Luther's career as a reformer was his posting on the church door of Wittenberg the Ninety-Five Theses on October 31st, 1517. These formed a passionate statement on the true nature of penitence, and a protest against the sale of indulgences. In issuing the theses, Luther expected the support of his ecclesiastical superiors, and it was only after three years of controversy during which he refused a summons to Rome, that he proceeded to publish those works that brought about his expulsion from the church. The year 1520 saw the publication of the three great documents which laid down the fundamental principles of the Reformation. In the Address to the Christian Nobility of the German Nation, Luther attacked the corruptions of the church and the abuses of its authority, and asserted the right of the laymen to spiritual independence. In Concerning Christian Liberty, he expounded the doctrine of justification by faith, and gave a complete presentation of his theological position. In the Babylonish Captivity of the Church, he criticized the sacramental system, and set up the scriptures as the supreme authority in religion. In the midst of this activity came his formal excommunication, and his renunciation of allegiance to the Pope. He was prescribed by the Emperor Charles V, and taken into the protection of prison in the Wartburg, by the friendly elector of Saxony, where he translated the New Testament. The complete translation of the Bible, issued in 1534, marks the establishment of the modern literary language of Germany. The rest of Luther's life was occupied with a vast amount of literary and controversial activity. He died at Eisleben, February 18th, 1546. Introductory Letter Jesus To the Most Reverend Father in Christ, and Most Illustrious Lord Albert, Archbishop and Primate of the Churches of Magdeburg, and Mintz, Marquis of Brandenburg, etc., his Lord and Pastor in Christ, most gracious and worthy of all fear and reverence, the grace of God be with you, and whatsoever it is and can do. Spare me, most reverend father in Christ, most illustrious prince, if I, the very dregs of humanity, have dared to think of addressing a letter to the eminence of your sublimity. The Lord Jesus is my witness that, in the consciousness of my own pettiness and baseness, I have long put off the doing of that which I have now hardened my forehead to perform, moved thereto most especially by the sense of that faithful duty which I feel that I owe to your most reverend fatherhood in Christ. May your highness then, in the meanwhile, deign to cast your eyes upon one grain of dust, and, in your pontifical clemency, to understand my prayer. Papal indulgences are being carried about, under your most distinguished authority, for the building of St. Peter's. In respect of these, I do not so much accuse the extravagant sayings of the preachers, which I have not heard, but I grieve at the very false ideas which the people conceive from them, and which are spread abroad in common talk on every side, namely, that unhappy souls believe that, if they buy letters of indulgences, they are sure of their salvation, also, that as soon as they have thrown their contribution into the chest, souls forthwith fly out of purgatory, and furthermore, that so great is the grace thus conferred, that there is no sin so great, 
even as they say if by an impossibility any one had violated the mother of god but that it may be pardoned and again that by these indulgences a man is freed from all punishment and guilt o oh, gracious god it is thus that the souls committed to your care most excellent father are being taught unto their death and a most severe account which you will have to render for all of them is growing and increasing hence i have not been able to keep silence any longer on this subject for by no function of a bishop's office can a man become sure of salvation since he does not even become sure through the grace of god infused in him but the apostle bids us to be ever working out our salvation in fear and trembling philippians two twelve even the righteous man says peter shall scarcely be saved first peter four eighteen in fact so narrow is the way which leads into life that the lord speaking by the prophets amos and zechariah calls those who are to be saved brands snatched from the burning and our lord everywhere declares the difficulty of salvation why then by these false stories and promises of pardon do the preachers of them make the people to feel secure and without fear since indulgences confer absolutely no good on souls as regards salvation or holiness but only take away the outward penalty which was wont of old to be canonically imposed lastly works of piety and charity are infinitely better than indulgences and yet they do not preach these with such display or so much zeal nay they keep silence about them for the sake of preaching pardons and yet it is the first and sole duty of all bishops that the people should learn the gospel and christian charity for christ nowhere commands that indulgences should be preached what a dreadful thing it is then what peril to a bishop if while the gospel is passed over in silence he permits nothing but the noisy outcry of indulgences to be spread among his people and bestows more care on these than on the gospel will not christ say to them straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel besides all this most reverend father in the lord in that instruction to the commissaries which has been put forth under the name of your most reverend fatherhood it is stated doubtless without the knowledge and consent of your most reverend fatherhood that one of the principal graces conveyed by indulgences is that inestimable gift of god by which man is reconciled to god and that all the pains of purgatory are done away with and further that contrition is not necessary for those who thus redeem souls or buy confessional licenses but what can i do excellent primate and most illustrious prince save to entreat your reverend fatherhood through the lord jesus christ to deign to turn on us the eye of fatherly care and to suppress that advertisement altogether and impose on the preachers of pardons another form of preaching lest perchance some one should at length arise who will put forth writings in confutation of them and of their advertisements to the deepest reproach of your most illustrious highness it is intensely abhorrent to me that this should be done and yet i fear that it will happen unless the evil be speedily remedied this faithful discharge of my humble duty i entreat that your most illustrious grace will deign to receive in a princely and bishop-like spirit that is with all clemency even as i offer it with a most faithful heart and one most devoted to your most reverend fatherhood since i too am part of your flock may the lord jesus keep your most reverend fatherhood for ever and ever amen from wittenberg on the eve of all saints in the year fifteen seventeen if it so please your most reverend fatherhood you may look at these disputations that you may perceive how dubious a matter is that opinion about indulgences which they disseminate as if it were most certain to your most reverend fatherhood martin luther disputation of dr martin luther concerning penitence and indulgences in the desire and with the purpose of elucidating the truth a disputation will be held on the underwritten propositions at wittenberg under the presidency of the reverend father martin luther 
monk of the order of st augustine master of arts and of sacred theology and ordinary reader of the same in that place he therefore asks those who cannot be present and discuss the subject with us orally to do so by letter in their absence in the name of our lord jesus christ amen one our lord and master jesus christ in saying repent ye etc intended that the whole life of believers should be penitence. 2. This word cannot be understood of sacramental penance, that is, of the confession and satisfaction which are performed under the ministry of priests. 3. It does not, however, refer solely to inward penitence. Nay, such inward penitence is not, unless it outwardly produces various mortifications of the flesh. 4. The penalty thus continues as long as the hatred of self, that is, true inward penitence, continues, namely, till our entrance into the kingdom of heaven. 5. The Pope has neither the will nor the power to remit any penalties except those which he has imposed by his own authority, or by that of the canons. 6. The Pope has no power to remit any guilt except by declaring and warranting it to have been remitted by God, or, at most, by remitting cases reserved for himself, in which cases, if his power were despised, guilt would certainly remain. 7. God never remits any man's guilt without at the same time subjecting him, humbled in all things, to the authority of his representative, the priest. 8. The penitential canons are imposed only on the living, and no burden ought to be imposed on the dying, according to them. 9. Hence the Holy Spirit, acting in the Pope, does well for us, in that, in his decrees, he always makes exception of the article of death and of necessity. 10. Those priests act wrongly and unlearnedly, who, in the case of the dying, reserve the canonical penances for purgatory. 11. Those tares about changing of the canonical penalty into the penalty of purgatory seem surely to have been sown while the bishops were asleep. 12. Formerly the canonical penalties were imposed not after, but before absolution, as tests of true contrition. 13. The dying pay all penalties by death, and are already dead to the canon laws, and are by right relieved from them. 14. The imperfect soundness or charity of a dying person necessarily brings with it great fear, and the less it is, the greater the fear it brings. 15. This fear and horror is sufficient by itself, to say nothing of other things, to constitute the pains of purgatory, since it is very near to the horror of despair. 16. Hell, purgatory, and heaven appear to differ as despair, almost despair, and peace of mind differ. 17. With souls in purgatory, it seems that it must needs be that, as horror diminish, so charity increases. 18. Nor does it seem to be proved by any reasoning or any scriptures that they are outside of the state of merit or of the increase of charity. 19. Nor does this appear to be proved that they are sure and confident of their own blessedness, at least all of them, though we may be very sure of it. 20. Therefore the Pope when he speaks of the plenary remission of all penalties, does not mean simply of all, but only of those imposed by himself. 21. Thus those preachers of indulgences are in error who say that, by the indulgences of the Pope, a man is loosed and saved from all punishment. 22. For, in fact, he remits to souls in purgatory no penalty which they would have had to pay in this life according to the canons. 23. If any entire remission of all penalties can be granted to anyone, it is certain that it is granted to none but the most perfect, that is, to very few. 24. 
24. Hence the greater part of the people must needs be deceived by this indiscriminate and high-sounding promise of release from penalties. 25. Such power as the Pope has over purgatory in general, such has every bishop in his own diocese, and every curate in his own parish in particular. 26. The Pope acts most rightly in granting remission to souls, not by the power of the keys, which is of no avail in this case, but by the way of suffrage. 27. They preach mad, who say that the soul flies out of purgatory as soon as the money thrown into the chest rattles. 28. It is certain that, when the money rattles in the chest, avarice and gain may be increased, but the suffrage of the church depends on the will of God alone. 29. Who knows whether all the souls in purgatory desire to be redeemed from it, according to the story told of St. Severinus and Paschal? 30. No man is sure of the reality of his own contrition, much less of the attainment of plenary remission. 31. Rare as is a true penitent, so rare is one who truly buys indulgences, that is to say, most rare. 32. Those who believe that, through letters of pardon, they are made sure of their own salvation, will be eternally damned along with their teachers. 33. We must especially beware of those who say that these pardons from the Pope are that inestimable gift of God by which man is reconciled to God. 34. For the grace conveyed by these pardons has respect only to the penalties of sacramental satisfaction, which are of human appointment. 35. They preach no Christian doctrine who teach that contrition is not necessary for those who buy souls out of purgatory or buy confessional licenses. 36. Every Christian who feels true compunction has of right plenary remission of pain and guilt, even without letters of pardon. 37. Every true Christian, whether living or dead, has a share in all the benefits of Christ and of the church given him by God, even without letters of pardon. 38. The remission, however, imparted by the Pope is by no means to be despised, since it is, as I have said, a declaration of the divine remission. 39. It is a most difficult thing, even for the most learned theologians, to exalt at the same time in the eyes of the people the ample effect of pardons and the necessity of true contrition. 40. True contrition seeks and loves punishment, while the ampleness of pardons relaxes it and causes men to hate it, or at least gives occasion for them to do so. 41. Apostolical pardons ought to be proclaimed with caution, lest the people should falsely suppose that they are placed before other good works of charity. 42. Christians should be taught that it is not the mind of the Pope that they buying of pardons is to be in any way compared to the works of mercy. 43. Christians should be taught that he who gives to a poor man, or lends to a needy man, does better than if he bought pardons. 44. Because, by a work of charity, charity increases, and the man becomes better, while by means of pardons he does not become better, but only freer from punishment. 45. Christians should be taught that he who sees anyone in need, and passing him by, gives money for pardons, is not purchasing for himself the indulgences of the Pope, but the anger of God. 46. Christians should be taught that, unless they have superfluous wealth, they are bound to keep what is necessary for the use of their own households, and by no means to lavish it on pardons. 47. Christians should be taught that, while they are free to buy pardons, they are not commanded to do so. 48. 
Christians should be taught that the Pope, in granting pardons, has both more need and more desire that devout prayer should be made for him, than that money should be readily paid. 49. Christians should be taught that the Pope's pardons are useful, if they do not put their trust in them, but most hurtful, if through them they lose the fear of God. 50. Christians should be taught that, if the Pope were acquainted with the exactions of the preachers of pardons, he would prefer that the Basilica of St. Peter should be burnt to ashes than that it should be built up with the skin, flesh, and bones of his sheep. 51. Christians should be taught that, as it would be the duty, so it would be the wish of the Pope, even to sell, if necessary, the Basilica of St. Peter, and to give of his own money to very many of those from whom the preachers of pardons extract money. 52. Vain is the hope of salvation through letters of pardon, even if a commissary, nay, the Pope himself, were to pledge his own soul for them. 53. They are enemies of Christ and of the Pope, who, in order that pardons may be preached, condemn the word of God to utter silence in other churches. 54. Wrong is done to the word of God when, in the same sermon, an equal or longer time is spent on pardons than on it. 55. The mind of the Pope necessarily is that if pardons, which are a very small matter, are celebrated with single bells, single processions, and single ceremonies, the gospel, which is a very great matter, should be preached with a hundred bells, a hundred processions, and a hundred ceremonies. 56. The treasures of the church, whence the Pope grants indulgences, are neither sufficiently named nor known among the people of Christ. 57. It is clear that they are at least not temporal treasures, for these are not so readily lavished, but only accumulated by many of the preachers. 58. Nor are they the merits of Christ and of the saints, for these, independently of the Pope, are always working grace to the inner man, and the cross, death, and hell to the outer man. 59. St. Lawrence said that the treasures of the church are the poor of the church, but he spoke according to the use of the word in his time. 60. We are not speaking rashly when we say that the keys of the church, bestowed through the merits of Christ, are that treasure. 61. For it is clear that the power of the Pope is alone sufficient for the remission of penalties and of reserved cases. 62. The true treasure of the Church is the holy gospel of the glory and grace of God. 63. This treasure, however, is deservedly most hateful, because it makes the first to be last. 64. While the treasure of indulgences is deservedly most acceptable, because it makes the last to be first. 65. Hence the treasures of the gospel are nets, wherewith of old they fished for the men of riches. 66. The treasures of indulgences are nets, wherewith they now fish for the riches of men. 67. Those indulgences, which the preachers loudly proclaim to be the greatest graces, are seen to be truly such as regards the promotion of gain. 68. Yet they are in reality in no degree to be compared to the grace of God and the piety of the cross. 69. Bishops and curates are bound to receive the commissaries of apostolic pardons with all reverence. 70. But they are still more bound to see to it with all their eyes, and take heed with all their ears, that these men do not preach their own dreams in place of the Pope's commission. 71. He who speaks against the truth of apostolical pardons, let him be anathema and accursed. 72. 
But he, on the other hand, who exerts himself against the wantonness and license of speech of the preachers of pardons, let him be blessed. 73. As the Pope justly thunders against those who use any kind of contrivance to the injury of the traffic in pardons. 74. Much more is it his intention to thunder against those who, under the pretext of pardons, use contrivances to the injury of holy charity and of truth. 75. To think that papal pardons have such power that they could absolve a man even if, by an impossibility, he had violated the mother of God, is madness. 76. We affirm, on the contrary, that papal pardons cannot take away even the least of venal sins, as regards its guilt. 77. The saying that, even if St. Peter were now Pope, he could grant no greater graces, is blasphemy against St. Peter and the Pope. 78. We affirm, on the contrary, that both he and any other Pope have greater graces to grant, namely the gospel, powers, gifts of healing, etc. 1 Corinthians 12.9 79. To say that the cross set up among the insignia of the papal arms is of equal power with the cross of Christ is blasphemy. 80. Those bishops, curates, and theologians who allow such discourses to have currency among the people will have to render an account. 81. This license in the preaching of pardons makes it no easy thing, even for learned men, to protect the reverence due to the Pope against the calumnies, or, at all events, the keen questionings of the laity. 82. As, for instance, why does not the Pope empty purgatory for the sake of most holy charity and of the supreme necessity of souls, this being the most just of all reasons? If he redeems an infinite number of souls, for the sake of that most fatal thing, money, to be spent on building a basilica, this being a very slight reason. 83. Again, why do funeral masses and anniversary masses for the deceased continue? And why does not the Pope return, or permit the withdrawal of the funds bequeathed for this purpose, since it is a wrong to pay for those who are already redeemed? 84. Again, what is this new kindness of God in the Pope, in that, for money's sake, they permit an impious man, and an enemy of God, to redeem a pious soul, which loves God, and yet do not redeem that same pious and beloved soul, out of free charity, on account of its own need? 85. Again, why is it that the penitential canons, long since abrogated and dead in themselves in very fact, and not only by usage, are yet still redeemed with money, through the granting of indulgences, as if they were full of life? 86. Again, why does not the Pope, whose riches are at this day more ample than those of the wealthiest of the wealthy, build the one basilica of St. Peter with his own money, rather than with that of poor believers? 87. Again, what does the Pope permit or impart to those who, through perfect contrition, have a right to plenary remission and participation? 88. Again, what greater good would the Church receive if the Pope, instead of once, as he does now, were to bestow these remissions and participations a hundred times a day on any one of the faithful? 89. Since it is the salvation of souls, rather than money, that the Pope seeks by his pardons, why does he suspend the letters and pardons granted long ago, since they are equally efficacious? 90. To repress these scruples and arguments of the laity by force alone, and not to solve them by giving reasons, is to expose the Church and the Pope to the ridicule of their enemies, and to make Christian men unhappy. 91. If, then, pardons were preached according to the spirit and mind of the Pope, all these questions would be resolved with ease, nay, would not exist. 92. Away, then, with all those prophets who say to the people of Christ, 
peace, peace, and there is no peace. 93. Blessed be all those prophets who say to the people of Christ, The cross, the cross, and there is no cross. 94. Christians should be exhorted to strive to follow Christ their head through pains, deaths, and hells. 95. And thus trust to enter heaven through many tribulations rather than in the security of peace. Protestation I, Martin Luther, doctor of the Order of Monks at Wittenberg, desire to testify publicly that certain propositions against pontifical indulgences, as they call them, have been put forth by me. Now, although, up to the present time, neither this most celebrated and renowned school of ours, nor any civil or ecclesiastical power, has condemned me, yet there are, as I hear, some men of headlong and audacious spirit, who dare to pronounce me a heretic, as though the matter had been thoroughly looked into and studied. But on my part, as I have often done before, so now, too, I implore all men, by the faith of Christ, either to point out to me a better way, if such a way has been divinely revealed to any, or at least to submit their opinion to the judgment of God and of the Church. For I am neither so rash as to wish that my sole opinion should be preferred to that of all other men, nor so senseless as to be willing that the word of God should be made to give place to fables devised by human reason. Dedicatory Letter To the respected and worthy Nicolas von Amstorf, licentiate in the Holy Scriptures and Canon of Wittenberg, my particular and affectionate friend, Dr. Martinus Luther. The grace and peace of God be with you, respected, worthy sir, and dear friend. The time for silence is gone, and the time to speak has come, as we read in Ecclesiastes 3.7. I have, in conformity with our resolve, put together some few points concerning the reformation of the Christian estate, with the intent of placing the same before the Christian nobility of the German nation, in case it may please God to help his church by means of the laity, inasmuch as the clergy, whom this task rather befitted, had become quite careless. I send all this to your worship, to judge and to amend where needed. I am well aware that I shall not escape the reproach of taking far too much upon me in presuming, insignificant and forsaken as I am, to address such high estates on such weighty and great subjects, as if there were no one in the world but Dr. Luther to have a care for Christianity and to give advice to such wise people. Let who will blame me. I shall not offer any excuse. Perhaps I still owe God and the world another folly. This debt I have now resolved honestly to discharge, as well as may be, and to be court fool for once in my life. If I fail, I shall at any rate gain this advantage, that no one need buy me a fool's cap or shave my pole. But it remains to be seen which shall hang the bells on the other. I must fulfill the proverb, when anything is to be done in the world, a monk must be in it, were it only as a painted figure. I suppose it has often happened that a fool has spoken wisely, and wise men have often done foolishly, as St. Paul says, If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. 1 Corinthians 3.18 now, inasmuch as I am not only a fool, but also a sworn doctor of the Holy Scriptures, I am glad that I have an opportunity of fulfilling my oath, just in this fool's way. I beg you to excuse me to the moderately wise, for I know not how to deserve the favor and grace of the supremely wise, which I have so often sought with much labor, but now for the future shall neither have nor regard. God help us to seek not our glory, but his alone. Amen. Wittenberg, in the Monastery of St. Augustine, on the eve of St. John the Baptist, in the year 1520. 
Jesus. End of the 95 Theses by Martin Luther